morning, everybody. Thanks for taking the time. <laughs> All right. Who's going to lead off? Well, good morning. My name is Steve Cherico. I'm the mayor of Naperville. Uh, happy to be here. Oh, sure. C H I R I C O. I'm the mayor of Naperville. And, uh, pleasure to be with you here this morning. Uh, as a municipal uh, elected official, I have to tell you one of the great things for me is uh, that it's nonpartisan. Because when we come up with a good idea, we mean someone on city council comes up with a good idea. If it's the right idea for the city, we vote on it. And so, uh, and, I, and I really believe that that's a, just a great way to, to run the city. And I hope we can keep that form of government. Uh, regardless of what whose idea it was in Springfield, that doesn't always seem to be the case, and that's troubling to me. And I wish we could, uh, we could change that. The stopgap budget that has been introduced uh, by our leaders in the House and Senate, uh, minority leaders, is a good idea. It's a good idea for the city of Naperville, and it's a good idea for the state of Illinois. And regardless of whose idea it was, it should be voted on and it should be passed. We need to take us from the point we are at today to some point in the future where we have a financial su sustainable plan. And uh, this stopgap uh, budget isn't a solution, it's a bridge. Uh, and it's a bridge that we need to, we need to take and, and improve now you know, so that we can get our children off the, off the bargaining table, so we can complete some of these projects that have been started in our, in our state, and so that we can, we can keep our government running and keeping our basic services uh, running smoothly. And this is just critically important for, for the citizens of Naperville and for the citizens of the state of Illinois. So I'm here to provide support for our governor uh, and our legislators. Uh, I'm not here to point fingers or, or, or blame. I'm just here to say, look, we need solutions. Uh, this stopgap budget is a good solution right now so that we can get to where we need to be uh, in the future with the financial plan that will be sustainable. So thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, my name is Larry Morsey, M-O-R-R-I-S-S-E-Y. I've been the mayor of the city of Rockford since 2005. And the first point I want to make is that I'm honored to be here joining other mayors as well as the governor uh, supporting the stopgap budget proposal. Um, it will move us forward, albeit it's not a perfect solution. It's a solution that gets us past the November elections and hopefully puts us in the best possible position to avoid the damage that I think was done to the state, done to our uh, ability to meet the expectations of our citizens and, and those that are most in need. The South Gap budget will allow operations to continue that allows critical road projects, other public infrastructure projects, economic development projects, city revenues, as well as uh, critical, critical opening of our schools to uh, happen, as well as the funding of many of our agencies that are supporting those in greatest need in our cities throughout the state of Illinois. So it's absolutely vital. I applaud the governor for pushing forward on this and the members of the legislature that have been working with the governor and his team to arrive at a compromise to get us through November. I would be remiss, however, if I didn't also mention the fact that since 2005, I, along with many other mayors, have consistently supported the spirit of the agenda that the governor has had with the turnaround agenda. It's controversial uh, because it's loaded with a lot of additional uh, politics, but the general trajectory and the trend of giving municipalities more uh, power, more authority to govern our affairs, that is something that I've consistently lobbied with other Illinois mayors as a member of the Illinois Municipal League since 2005. My hope would be that after the November elections, the legislature could come back together and with the support of the uh, individual members as well as their leaders, uh, work with the governor to arrive at a compromise on a long-term solution. That could involve, hopefully, uh, appropriate reforms as well as a appropriate discussion about revenues that might be necessary to pass a balanced and financially responsible budget. Be happy to take questions after uh, the rest of the presentations. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Sean Widener, Village President for Village of Muhammad, Widener, W-I-D-E-N-E-R. It's an honor to be here today. Um, the Village of Muhammad, like many cities and towns in the state of Illinois, 
we're highly dependent on our school system, school districts. They represent the core of our community, but more importantly, they represent stability, of which we all desperately need. We need a state budget. We need road construction projects to continue to progress. We need local governance to continue without further delay. And most importantly, we need to restore the confidence for all the citizens within the state. So with that, I'll introduce the governor. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for taking the time. I'd like to thank the mayors who took time out of their very busy schedules to join us here in the Capitol today. Appreciate your leadership very much. I'd like to thank all the mayors that signed the letter of support for the stopgap budget and the education funding bill, the 41 mayors who signed on. And there are many, many dozens of more mayors around the state that know that we are fighting for them to give more ability for the mayors to run their communities, manage their affairs um, without undue uh, influence, unfunded mandates and restrictions on the ability of mayors to do their job. These are CEOs. They are elected uh, executives to lead their communities. I'm a CEO for the state. I work for them. One of my primary duties is to help them do their jobs better. And what they've said to me repeatedly is, we need Springfield to get less involved in their affairs, stop Springfield telling them how they have to run their communities, let them run their own communities the way they best see fit. I believe that that is the right answer for the long-term prosperity of Illinois. These mayors believe it, and most of the mayors around the state uh, emphatically believe that as well. Uh, you know we're at a critical time for Illinois. We don't have a budget. The General Assembly left May 31st, left Springfield. They haven't been back. Uh, they left without passing any budget whatsoever. Last year's budget, $5 billion out of balance. This year's budget, not existing whatsoever. Um, we are on the verge of a crisis with no budget whatsoever. There's the, the uh, possibility that starting July 1st, essential services could be shut. Key services could cease to be provided. Road construction could, could stop. Um, uh, corrections and public safety could be shut down. Uh, essential services for our most vulnerable, our most at need and most at risk families could cease to be supported. And our, there's a risk that in August our schools can't open on time with proper funding. This would be just an outrageous, tragic failure for the people of Illinois. We cannot allow this to happen. That's the reason I applaud Leader Redonio and Leader Redurkin uh, for, for stepping up and introducing two bills to get us through this crisis. They've introduced a stopgap budget. It's not a long-term solution, but it allows for the appropriation of key uh, funds from existing accounts. The money is there. We, we raise over $32 billion a year. The money is there to provide essential services um, uh, on a continuing basis for public safety, for construction, for human services. Um, that are essential for the, the, the well-being of the people of Illinois, along with an education budget that puts some more money, not a lot more, but some more money into our K-12 school system, an affordable amount more money. Uh, last year, the General Assembly didn't put as much money into K-12 uh, schools as I asked for, and this year they didn't pass an education budget at all. And our teachers, our students must come first, no matter what else, our future is our children. Our schools deserve to open on time with more money. And Leader Durkin and Leader Redonio have introduced an education funding bill. It puts $240 million more into our education system. Um, it's, it's fair. It's affordable. It's the right thing to do. And um, I hope that the General Assembly will pass these two bills. The mayors are here supporting the General Assembly taking that action, and many leaders across the state likewise support taking this action. Now, uh, I'm pleased that finally um, the, the leaders in the supermajority have decided to come back here to Springfield and do their jobs. They're coming back Wednesday. Um, I wish they'd been here all the last few weeks because I think we would have already been able to vote if they had been. I think we could have dealt with these issues by now. Um, I have reached out. Our office has reached out to Speaker Madigan and President Cullerton. I've requested a four-leader meeting for tomorrow in preparation for the Wednesday General Assembly session, because I would like that General Assembly session to be as productive as possible, and the goal is to pass these two bills. We've got to pass the bills. We can't afford more time to drag on. And I've offered, I'm here in Springfield most days of the week, although in recent weeks I've needed to travel back up to Chicago more because I've been negotiating with um, 
members of the Democratic supermajority up in Chicago. But I've offered for tomorrow's meeting, I'm happy to meet here in Springfield where I am, or I'm happy to travel up to Chicago tomorrow to meet with uh, Speaker Madigan and President Culleton. We should have a meeting to prepare to make sure that the session on Wednesday is productive as possible. I think the good news is um, it looks like we pretty well have an agreement on the stopgap budget itself. Uh, the supermajority has asked for more spending than what I think is appropriate. Uh, we do not want to get, put spending that causes more unpaid bills and that is unaffordable and would force a big tax hike uh, on the people of Illinois next winter. Uh, but I think we can work out a compromise and we're pretty well there. The, the differences are very, very minor. We're basically done in the stopgap budget part. Um, and we should be done on the education funding bill. But uh, uh, President Cullerton in particular, along now with Speaker Madigan, what they've said is no deals, no budget unless the funding formula changes and we get a lot more money for Chicago public schools. And they've basically threatened to hold up the entire funding process and the budget process for a bailout of CPS. Let me be clear, that is wrong, that is unfair, that's just not reasonable for the children around the state of Illinois taxpayers around the state of Illinois, parents around the state of Illinois, homeowners around the state of Illinois. The people across the state should not be held up with their tax money to go bail out Chicago public schools. CPS has been financially mismanaged for years and years. They have been running massive deficits, massive debt, not funding their pensions, even while state the state government, through state taxpayers, have been, has been sending contributions to the teacher's pension in Chicago, $60 million, $60 million per year most years, as well as a $200 million block grant every year, even though enrollment at CPS has been declining. Despite that $260 million um, state-funded advantage that CPS has gotten and no other school district has, CPS has refused to fund their own pensions for years. They've kicked the can down the road, and they've run their school system as much or more for patronage and political uh, purposes than they have to educate their children. It's a failure on the part of the mayor. It's a failure on the part of CPS leadership. And what is patently unfair is for them to try to force Illinois taxpayers, families across the state, to bail out that failure. Now, we've seen um, here, I don't know if you noticed, I, I saw it, the, the Tribune ran an article that the mayor is going to the city council uh, to request authority to buy CPS debt. Um, that's mostly bad news, but I'll say one good part of that is the mayor is finally acknowledging that it is the city's responsibility to fix the mismanagement of their own schools the city's responsibility. This is not a state responsibility. This is not the state voters, taxpayers' fault that CPS is in such big trouble. It's the failure of the city itself, the failure of their elected officials, and the, uh, the failure of their school board, which is appointed by the mayor. That's where the responsibility lies. Now, the good news is this is an acknowledgment by the mayor that the city needs to step up and start to deal with their own problems. Here's the bad news, the really bad news is their solution is not really a solution. It's more kicking the can down the road. For CPS debt to be bought by the city, when, as an indication that frankly, they probably can't even go to the bond market again, they've been so financially mismanaged, all that does is further kick the can down the road. That, all that does is almost guarantee an even bigger tax hike later on for the city residents of Chicago. That is wrong. That is a failure of the leadership. That is failure from the mayor. My, and my question, I've asked many of you, I hope some of you when you talk to the mayor or, or your affiliates talk to the mayor, why hasn't the mayor been in Springfield? Why hasn't President Cullerton been working with the mayor to advocate President Cullerton's pension reform plan, apply it to Chicago's teacher pension? Why haven't been doing That's reform. That could save hundreds of millions, billions of dollars for taxpayers in Chicago. Why haven't they been doing that? That's reform. That would help solve the problem. They're not doing it. The mayor and the president aren't advocating to get President Cullerton's pension reform plan to apply to Chicago pensions. They're silent on it. Likewise, why hasn't the mayor been working with the General Assembly to create bankruptcy as an option? Maybe if the mayor says, well, that would be a signal, a too strong signal of failure of leadership of the city to have a bankruptcy for schools. I get that argument. However, having bankruptcy be at least an option that could be on the table. The mayor doesn't have to choose that option. But having it be an option will change 
the contract negotiation dynamic very fundamentally with any of the taxpayer funded used unions, the teachers union or any others. Right now in Illinois, Illinois, Illinois is a state where when the special interest groups that are funded by taxpayers negotiate with politicians and get the politicians to give them pretty much everything they want through threatening to strike or other intimidation, that's what's been going on for years. Right now the only option is raise taxes. That's the only option. Other states have created a different option. If the, if the uh, local government, the local school district, makes too many promises they can't afford, gets an un, un, a, bill, a, a budget that's unsustainable for their community, they can restructure their debts under the supervision of a court. We need that option available to communities in, in Illinois. Cities should have it, counties should have it, school districts should have it, and CPS is a classic candidate for it. And what I firmly believe, done properly, bankruptcy can preserve teacher jobs. They, it can preserve other administrative staff jobs by restructuring debts, restructuring contracts to make them more affordable and sustainable so people don't have to lose their jobs. We don't have to have class sizes increase, but the fundamental structure of CPS can change and become more affordable for the taxpayers of the state. Why hasn't the mayor been working with the General Assembly supermajority that he's very close to to get these kinds of reforms to protect the taxpayers in Chicago? He hasn't done it. No reforms whatsoever. The mayor is purely trying to kick the can, borrow more. They borrowed more for CPS and the city last year. They, they deferred and delayed their pension payments to their police and fire pension plan. All that does is borrow more money at 8%. All that does is ensure a bigger tax hike later. And right now, they're not reforming their system. They're not getting pension reform for Chicago. They're not getting bankruptcy as an option to use as negotiating leverage in contract negotiations, because really what should happen is the mayor should negotiate a much more affordable, sustainable teachers union contract. But la five years ago, the, the, the mayor caved. He couldn't stand up to the, uh, the threat, the, the actuality of a strike and caved in. He's ready to do that now, but if he had bankruptcy as an option, his negotiating leverage could be fundamentally different. They're not advocating for reforms. They're purely kicking the can. And what we, we will stand, always stand against is while they're kicking the can and not solving their problems, they will not put their financial mismanagement on the backs of Illinois taxpayers across the state of Illinois. We will stand against that. That is not right. That is not fair for the school children, homeowners, parents, all, all across the state of Illinois. Chicago taxpayers need to be protected. I want to work for them and protect them, but the right way to do that is to get reforms and have Chicago fix its own problems. With that, I'll open it up to Governor, questions. Governor, you said uh, essential services. I'm not quoting exactly. Essential services will shut down July 1st without... Well, it won't be exactly July 1st, but starting July 1st, there's the risk. What's the difference? I mean, I know last week you said capital construction will shut down, for example. With all the court orders uh, mandating funding, what, what will change this July 1st? Well, so the court orders obviously vary. So we're under um, um, various court orders in different departments, different agencies for different services, Medicaid services, um, certain salaries, certain staffing levels. You know, there's maintenance of effort under federal rules. In order to um, get federal money, you have to maintain a certain level of spending in a certain department or certain agency. So um, some, some elements of our, uh, of our government are pre being provided by requirement from outside agencies or the federal government or courts. Um, but there are many activities, road construction, um, some human services, um, uh, public safety services that are not mandated, that are not uh, required from, from the outside. And uh, without appropriation, without the ability for me to be authorized to spend money to fund those particular activities, at some point starting in July, they could cease. And that would be, that would be just an unacceptable disaster for the people of Illinois. You I'm sorry? Said, you said public safety, for example. Um, the paychecks are continuing. You've seen to that. Uh, what, what kind of public safety might be? Oh, goodness. There's all kinds. Supplies for public safety. Fuel. Um, uh, utilities. Um, uh, computer contracts information services. There's a lot that goes into public safety that's not just salaries. Governor, last year we didn't have construction projects shutting down July 1. I mean, already we see stories about I signed the I signed the appropriation bill for capital last year. Governor, <laughs> Governor, Governor regarding CPS, previously you had supported some form of bailout if it came with reforms in the turnaround agenda. Turnaround agenda is off the table temporarily. 
you're pushing up a stop gap. Does that mean that you won't support any one-off funding for CPS right now? And does Correct. That you up, does that open up the argument that you're holding up state funding not to bail CPS out? <laughs> That's a nice spin. Our opponents will try to do that. Um, CPS has been financially mismanaged for decades. It's not the fault of the people of Illinois. And, and um, I've always said I'll do some amount of, of bad policy as part of getting a lot of good policy. I've always said that. That's politics. That's trade-off. Right now, there are no reforms coming from the other side of the aisle, zero. Speaker Madigan has no interest in compromising on anything, while I have repeatedly offered compromise, repeatedly offered ways to um, try to come to a solution that all sides could agree to. And the reason I've emphasized the key parts of the reforms I have is because every reform we're currently advocating is supported by a majority of Democrats in the state. We are not, our reforms are not partisan. They are supported by Democrats and Republicans. That's the reason I've stayed so strong in those. Do agencies have any plans to go to court to get orders to keep money flowing? I won't go into our contingency plans. We have a number of contingency plans if, if we have to, we have to uh, use them. Uh, the right thing to do, the right thing to do for the people of Illinois is to pass, uh, pass the stopgap budget and to pass our education funding bill so our schools can open on time with a little bit more money. Governor Crane's Chicago Business editorialized this weekend that they were wrong when they endorsed you and they thought that you could get stuff done. And they said, <laughs> by nearly every measure, the state is worse off since Ronald took office. And they talk about pensions and social service agencies laying people off and schools not getting money. Uh, and they basically say you should try to pass the balance budget because Democrats are not going to pass the turnaround reforms that you want. So that's a big business publication, so I thought it was appropriate to ask. What do you think of that? <laughs> uh, uh, our state has been going in the wrong direction for a long, long time. And if all we do to try to, quote, balance our budget is to put in a big tax hike and do nothing else, it would continue the failure. We continue to lose jobs. We continue to be low economic growth. We continue to have family incomes falling. Um, we, we have good going, and we've continued to have the highest property taxes in America. And you can just look at the other states where there's no balance between the special interest groups inside government and the taxpayers. New Jersey, Connecticut, New York, California, the states like that have constant financial duress, very high taxes, constant debt, constant deficits, huge unfunded pensions, and much lower economic growth than they would otherwise because they haven't taken on. In Illinois, special interests are up here, taxpayers are down here. States like Texas as an example, but there are many others, taxpayers are treated as a priority and special interests are lower. I'm just trying to get some balance in the state. If we have balance, we will have balanced budgets and we will grow. And if we don't change the regulatory climate and the business climate in Illinois, we will never have balanced budgets. We can't get balanced budgets unless we are pro-growth, pro-investment, pro-job creation. And today in Illinois, we're not, and I can guarantee you what would happen. I've talked to the business community. The reason the business community is standing so strongly behind, and Cranes is supposed to be a business publication, but if you read their, uh, I won't go into their philosophical leanings based on their writing, but they're, they're a little more collectivist than your standard uh, business are publication would be. <laughs> Uh, I won't go into which elements at City Hall or other places have big influence at different publications. It's, it doesn't really matter. What matters is the state is reformed and we can grow our economy to get balanced budgets. You talk, you talk about House and Senate leadership decided to finally come back this week because they've been gone since May 31st. I mean, at the same time, could you have called them back? I know you said that you've seen in the past it doesn't work, but if they weren't going to come back on their own until this week, why not force them to come back well, and force them into the discussion? Yeah, so you, you answered the question is because it's been tried by other governors, it's always failed. I'd like to le learn a little bit from history. Now they're coming back of their own volition. Now we have an opportunity, and this is where I need your listeners, your viewers, your readers, do something. Don't just come and then go home. You came, you should be doing your job, do the right thing. Let's pass the stopgap budget, which is pretty well baked and pretty well agreed to, and let's make sure our schools open. Don't hold, don't do blackmail on the people of Illinois holding up the schools opening to bail out CPS. CPS has created its own problems. Chicago has created its own challenges. Chicago should handle its challenges, and Chicago should do reforms. The mayor should be demanding reforms, not just more borrowing to kick the can. How do you know, how do you know the mayors from across the state here? Where is the mayor of the capital city? I don't know. Is there a scenario? Scenario? Could ask him. I don't know. The team could ask. I don't know. Governor, is there a scenario that you can sign a stopgap to keep 
most of guys are not ready, but then the question still remains for K-12. Is that where we are right now? Yeah. We, we, need, we must have schools open. We must, and, and schools deserve to open. And they've got to make their planning now. If we wait, and I'm worried that the General Assembly is going to want to wait all through the month of July, schools need to plan. They need to make their contracts. They need to make their offers to teachers. We, we can't wait. But if, but if Democrats don't come off of help for CPS, are you willing to not let schools open if that's the ultimate game plan here, that they insist CPS? We will use every power of our office and our ability to influence to make sure that schools open on time, no bailout of CPS, that is not fair to the Illinois taxpayers, and that um, essential government services get provided. We will do everything in our power. How do you know, Governor, that uh, their, their step measure is pretty much agreed to? Uh, there have been a lot of discussions between our administration and um, Democratic leaders. We, we, it's pretty clear that we're, what we're like? about there. We'll, actually, we'll talk more about that later. You can talk to our communication we, staff about we, that. Uh, Speaker Mag in the past has, has in fact, he did it last summer for <laughs> that would be what what here here's what's happened so so the the working groups bipartisan working groups were very productive it took a while but they were getting very close to an agreement on reforms and a balanced budget they were very close back what's it been six eight weeks now speaker got wind they were getting close because it was not that group was the, the working groups were not authorized by by him he put his thumb on it and stopped it the working groups have pretty well come to a grinding. I mean, they still talk and they still meet, but it's the, the progress has been to hit, to hit a barricade. Um, and what President Culleton and the Speaker have made clear to me in our discussions, and they've, they've said in various places, they don't want to vote on a balanced budget. They don't want to vote on reforms until after the November election. So why would we do a month to month? Let's get through the November election. That's what the speaker and the president have indicated. That's, now, to me, that's a dereliction of duty. Why, why should we let what's good for the people of Illinois be held up for a, an election? We should just do the right thing now. We should vote right now for a balanced budget. We should vote right now for reforms. My own belief is they're hoping they pick up some seats, and then they can jam through a CPS bailout and um, a, a, a tax hike without any reforms at all. I believe that's their goal. That's their hope. Our, I'm, I'm obviously hoping that we can prevent that because that would be terrible for the long term of the state. Last question. Wouldn't you then benefit if the opposite happened, if they lose their supermajority or their supermajority? Isn't there a benefit to you the way you the election as well? I'd rather get it done now. I've been pushing really hard. We've been pushing for more than a year. The right answer for the people of Illinois is to get a balanced budget and to get reform so we can grow our economy. I'm out there talking to business owners in, who I'm trying to keep in the state as well as recruit to the state fairly regularly. They're all saying, Governor Boy, if you could sh show that taxpayers have a voice in Illinois and you're not just going to go down the same bad road that New Jersey, for example, has gone down or the state of Connecticut's gone down, constant debt and deficits, and all they do is raise taxes. All they do is raise taxes to cover their deficit. They don't get a balance of power between taxpayers and the special interests. That's what I'm fighting to do so we can, we can recruit companies here, grow more good paying jobs, and expand our tax base. That will get us long-term balanced budgets. We should make Illinois an economic powerhouse. Every other challenge we face as a state gets fixed if we make Illinois an economic powerhouse that's very competitive and attractive to uh, businesses. Thank Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.